Good evening, guests and fellow Toastmasters. A warm welcome to meeting number 25 of the Gabby's International Toastmaster Club. I am Toastmaster Bimpi Kumari, your Sergeant at Arms for today's meeting. As a Sergeant at Arms, it's my duty to highlight some key points for the meeting. The meeting is blocked for two hours and also urging you to stay for the entire duration to get the maximum benefits of it. Second, your video should be on and audio should be off and unmute yourself when you are called to speak or need to speak. Third, regarding the topics of sex, religion and politics, even though Toastmaster International doesn't put any restrictions on speaking on these topics, at the Gabby's Toastmaster Club, we request all speakers and role takers to be mindful and responsible and abstain from expressing any controversial views on this sensitive topics. Also urge you to be cognizant of the fact that we as a club practice diversity and inclusion in later and spread hands, ensuring there is no sexist, racist, or any such undertones that create hostility and discomfort for members or guests. Now I'll take a few moments uh, to reiterate our club mission we provide a supportive and positive learning experience in which members are empowered to develop communication and leadership skills, resulting in greater self-confidence and personal growth. Let me now introduce Toastmaster of the today's meeting. He hails from Quant town of Varda in Maharashtra as a millennial. His childhood was devoid of the internet leaving him with ample time of two of his greatest passions, reading and playtime. His collection of over 300 plus books shared by his mother and sister is a testament for his love for literature. He's a, he's a graduate in engineering from Pune and after that he did his MBA in Bangalore where he completed my first stint as a Toastmaster. Everyone applause him, greet him and applause him. By this, I'm handing over the stage to Toastmaster Sovika. Stage is yours. Thank you for the warm welcome, Sergeant at Arms. Welcome everyone and a warm, warm, warm welcome from Gurgaon itself, where recently you had a temperature of 50 degrees. So guys, I'm very jealous of whoever is in Bangalore right now, but a very warm welcome from my side. I would also like to see some cameras on uh, with such energy and enthusiasm that Gabby creates has these meetings. A couple of cameras should be on. I won't cold call, but I would definitely see want to see your smiling faces. For the benefit of guests today, I would like to explain the structure for today's meeting. Like a regular Toastmasters meeting, we'll have three sections, the prepared speech, the table topic section, and obviously the evaluation section. But here comes a little twist. We will have our table topic section first, and then we'll move on to the prepared speeches. Now, I know everyone has seen a cricket match along with the players. We have some of the most important members in the, in the stadium itself. That is the umpires. They check and oh, they check whether everything is followed by the rules. Today, in our cricket match, we have a timer who will officiate the timings of all the speeches. I would like to uh, call Toastmaster Tanushri, who is a global merchandiser at a top fashion retail brand. An adventurer lover often found hiking in the mountains or soaking up the sun in the beaches and a fitness enthusiast who recently completed her first half marathon. She joined Toastmaster to gain confidence and get comfortable striking up conversations with new faces. Toastmaster Tanushi, I'd like to call upon you. Tanushi is uh, not audible actually. Yeah, your mic is switched off. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Shovik. Uh, good evening, fellow Toastmasters and guests. As a timer for today's meeting, I will time the prepared speeches that also includes a panel discussion, table topics, and the evaluation. 
I will also alert each speaker of the time they have left using the green, yellow, and red cards as Zoom background. Uh, for better understanding, I will quickly show how this looks like, the green, yellow, and red. Uh, so for, uh, just a second, yeah. Yeah, so for table topic speakers, the time limit is two minutes. At one minute, I will show the green card. At uh, one minute, 30 seconds, I will show the yellow card. At two minutes, I will show the red card. And for evaluators, the time limit is two to three minutes. At two minutes, I will show the green card. At two minutes, 30 seconds, I will show the yellow card. And at three minutes, I will show the red card. Today, we have uh, prepared speeches of various time limits. So I will flash the cards as per the agenda. Uh, it's important to note that you have 30 seconds of grace time on either side for prepared speeches and evalu evaluation. However, for table topics, you only have 30, 30 seconds of grace time on the higher side meaning the time limit is one to two minutes. So it will be okay as long as you finish between one minute to two minute, 30 seconds. Hope everyone is clear. I'll be back with the report towards the end of the meeting. Thank you. Over to you, Toastmaster of the day, Shovik. Thank you, Taimu, for graciously explaining us all the rules. Now let's dive into the most interesting section of the day. That is the table topics. But we always need to know who is heading this section. Today, we have Toastmaster Smruti, who is going to head this section. She was a sales, she is a sales manager by profession and a certified soft skills trainer by interest. After almost a decade, she is now a full-time management student by the virtue of time. She has joined Toastmaster to sharpen her saw of public speaking. Outside of Toastmaster, she is a mindful, introverted soul whose life revolves around food made by others, family, and dance. Over to you, Toastmaster, Table Topics Master of the Day. Thank you so much, Toastmaster of the Day. Fellow Toastmasters and my dear guest, did you see that? That's called energy. That's called passion. So let's keep the momentum going and please feel free to come on camera with the smiling faces and let's begin with the most exciting segment of a, any Toastmasters meeting. So what exactly is the table topic? In our layman's language, let's say it's an impromptu speaking, a situation where you come up with a, maybe a topic or an instance or which is wanted or unwanted and asked for and you're on the spot. Now, what will you do? You have to be prepared sometimes to face such situation. Now, with this particular segment, you will get an opportunity to speak out. To read out for you, table topic enables an individual to develop the skill of impromptu speaking. It helps you to train our brain quickly organize and express the thoughts on a given situation in general and a topic in specific. It helps you to further develop your critical thinking, creativity, communication and listening skills as well. Now, you may consider a table topic as a mini speech. So whenever, when I give you a topic, consider it as a speech while delivering, which will consist of an opening, a body and a conclusion. Try and to frame and structure it around the same. Now this will help you to have a structured speech anywhere down the road. Now the most interesting part, everyone, members, guests, role takers, non-role takers, everyone can participate in this particular segment. Let me reiterate the each speaker, the moment I give you a topic, will get one to two minutes to speak. Participants uh, will get disqualified from the polls in case you do not meet within the time frame. You will get 30 second grace period once the two minutes is done. I hope the timing part is clear. So please keep a keen eye on the timers window as well. Now I'll call out your names and give topic to you to speak. But if you are keen and excited, feel free to raise your hand just like Dina. So I'll definitely post the first question for Dina over chat. She can uh, answer the same. And Dina, we will read out your uh, answer as well as a special evaluation for you 
later part okay so this topic is for dina the topic is what makes you smile dina what makes you smile here it goes over the chat now let's see who is keen to take the next topic can i start with um, let me see a couple of faces here come on people try to be on camera okay uh, toastmaster joan are you here in this room yes i am shall we go ahead with you yeah sure okay toastmaster joan if not now then when if not now then when toastmaster joan it's very difficult for me to talk about quotes because quotes are something that we all are hearing somewhere or the other if not now then when if not here then where if not today then tomorrow tell me how many of you actually listen to the meaning of the quote and apply it in your daily life how many of you do that can you show me a raise of hand i don't do it honestly i never have done that i know the deeper meaning of every single quote but when i'm faced with problems in my life or faced with situations where i can actually apply these quotes 99% of the time i don't remember them this is the reality the fact so then what do these quotes mean right like what is the point of saying if not now then when and all these quotes and i have found the answer to this this question because i have done a lot of deep reflection on why we humans care so much about quotes the fact is when actually we are in a situation a problem we may not remember these quotes but most of the life lessons that we learn we learn through these quotes when i had to tell my younger niece that you know what stop procrastinating do your homework right now i actually used kabir's doha those who know the doha you know kal kare so aaj kar and i used that doha beautifully and explained the concept of time and the importance of now and that is when i realized even though i had a very uh, vague attitude towards these proverbs and quotes it is very important for us human beings because there is no other way to make people learn their lessons without actually experiencing them if not for the quotes so if not now then when i don't know it's up to you honestly not everything is supposed to be done today not everything is supposed to be procrastinated for tomorrow but next time when you hear a quote i just hope you sit down take some moments and reflect on what it means because if not now then some other day you can use this code to explain it to someone else and teach a life lesson thank you and back to you thank you so much rus master joan i thought to put a cliche dialogue and a cliche statement and never thought you will transform it to a kabir's doha and further giving me mindful lessons on the same thank you so much for that snippet of life okay uh, who is next any volunteer come on i can see smiling faces okay toastmaster j if i am pronouncing it correctly dr j thank you so much now i am more eager to put cliche dialogues and cliche questions today to here it goes for you but i am sure that i'll get something very interesting here now your topic is which is worse failing or never trying at all dr j which is worse failing or never trying at all so which is worse failing or never trying so for me failing i think it is better never trying is worse because in my life if you take i was a former banker so in my banking career when i was initiating a micro banking project we failed many times so during those times we hesitated to tell our failures but our project authorities encouraged us to share the failures because they 
told us that failure is the first step for success. So we were very confident to share our lessons, what we learned from those failures. We met more than 100 failures, but each one we converted into a rule and evolved with so many guidelines so that in future we will not miss on that. So that is why we came up with a very good uh, this microfinance guidelines and the program was scaled up across India. And I've been also in that same uh, field for more than 30 years. So I always liked failures. So one thing which we need to do so failing is not bad, but we need to be uh, resilient to bounce back from our failures and keep watching the voice. That's all. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. J, for uh, giving us that mindfulness about uh, resilience. That's a key, uh, whether in uh, your personal life or professional life, I have personally witnessed the importance and impact of being resilient and how you bounce back in the toughest situation. Thank you so much for sharing those insights with us. Okay, then. I see a raise of hands, Sanjay Jain. Are you here with us in the room? Yeah, yeah, I'm there. I, I, my bandwidth is not allowing, so I'm not open, able to open all the time. No problem. Here is another question for you. What are you most grateful for? Prasmar Sanjay Jain, what are you most grateful for? Uh, thank you for the topic. Uh, uh, I'm most grateful uh, for uh, everything I have got in my life, uh, uh, whether it's a success or a failure, everything has taught me a lesson. Uh, so uh, it's a very uh, well said uh, that uh, uh, we learn from our failures and, uh, and success uh, makes us... Uh, uh, to be humble and uh, be positive. When uh, I was a child, uh, I was not put in, at studies. And uh, so uh, at that time, I was uh, only thinking about that, how I can improve upon my studies and uh, get a good grades. Uh, so God was a uh, uh, very fair favor to me. And uh, I could get the guidance for my, my slippings and things like that and work on my uh, weakness and uh, improve upon it and then achieve uh, great heights in my education career. Uh, so that has taught me that uh, uh, to be humble and uh, to be mindful of uh, things, uh, we, may be uh, we may fail or we may, uh, uh, we may get success, but never to lose our humbleness in our life. Uh, so that, uh, 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 that, uh, that alone will make us, uh, uh, whether uh, we are, uh, 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 distinguish us uh, from being a good human being or not. Um, so that was a take for me and thank you very much for giving me this topic. Thank you, thank you so much to Master Sanjay for letting us know that it's not only one thing for which we need to be grateful. It's about the humbleness in your entire life towards many situations and instances. Thank you so much for that wise advice. Moving ahead with Toastmaster Preeti, are you ready for the question? Sure, Toastmaster Smriti, I'm ready. Okay, here it goes. Are you more worried about doing things right or doing the right things? Toastmaster Preeti, are you more worried about doing things right or doing the right things? Over to you. Thank you, Toastmaster Smriti. Um, now, for the longest time, I remember I always wanted to do things the right way and because of that I started procrastinating I started delaying things trying to be the perfectionist doing the things uh, perfectly right so that I get the best feedback and best uh, comments uh, from my reviewers but over the time I realized it's not the um, date and the time uh, the fee feedbacks um, I receive the best feedbacks I receive it is the thing uh, about delivering the things at the right time so that is what I realized um, in the shortest span of my career also. I try to deliver things at the correct uh, time and the feedback has to depend on that. And because of that, I have started to prioritize things and work things accordingly. Um, now about doing the right things, uh, it is very, very important uh, in my life 
um, to do the right things because I always uh, try and keep ethics uh, the first uh, priority before anything else. And if that is correct, I think anything, everything else can be taken care of. But if you're ethically wrong, um, I think uh, you even if you do very great things, um, it's still not right. So thank you so much. Uh, over to you, TTM. Thank you so much, Master Preeti. It's not only the what part you addressed, you gave me the why as well. And also why you would do it. The ethics being in place and that matters the most actually. Thank you so much for taking this opportunity and going ahead with the same. Moving ahead, can I see more raise of hands? Okay. We have many people here. Okay, then I see one raise of hand, Bhagya Lakshmi. Welcome back. Are you ready to take the question? Yes, yes, Mrithi. Okay, then tell me, what has life recently taught you? What has life recently taught you? Toastmaster Bhagya Lakshmi. What has life recently taught me? A few days ago, I got a news from one of my school groups that one of our friends passed away. It was shocking. I never expected something like that would happen because it was not an age, neither he had any problem, right? He met with an accident. So life, after this incident, I, I started reflecting back on life and thought life itself is a great thing. It is so fragile. Every moment that we are here, we have to cherish. We don't know when we wouldn't be here. So every, every minute, every moment has to be cherished and lived completely, ensuring that people around you are happy. We need not have to think about uh, when when is our turn, but at the same time, we have to ensure that ev every moment matters and we, uh, we, we use the time that is given to us judiciously and also help others as much as possible. So this is one of the most important things that I got to reflect upon and that a uh, takeaway that I have. Thank you. Back to you, Table Topic Master. Thank you so much, Dr. Master Bhagya Lakshmi. That was such a deep uh, insights which you shared with us. Life is too short to dwell upon certain things. And uh, it's very important to live in the present and see what's there for us. Thank you so much for uh, taking us through some uncharted memory and some uh, key message of life. Thank you so much. I am falling short of words to express my emotions here, but thanks a lot. Next, who is ready? I can see the raise of hands. Dina, we, I read your uh, uh, table topic. We will definitely read it out and spotlight you. And meanwhile, let's go ahead. I can see Michael. Are you ready for your question? Can uh, I yes, yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Okay, then we are talking a lot about life. We're talking a lot about learnings. In similar lines, would you help me understand where do you find your inspiration? Toastmaster Michael, where do you find your inspiration? Um, so, yes, I uh, actually uh, find my inspiration a lot. There is no specific person uh, in my life. Now, in each and every phase in my life, I do find some inspiration. And after certain times, that gets vanished. But again, someone will pop up and uh, you know, inspire me a lot. So in such a way, I make my life. You know, somewhere I go, and it's not only the leaders. I could see some people uh, from like day-to-day -day life. Certain times, I do think that uh, you know, uh, we are living a very sophisticated life. We are Rather than that, we do face a lot of difficulties in our life. But... Uh, certain cases when we move out of the box and think uh, people in the roadside, they do face a lot of uh, difficulties in their life. When compared to that, the the things that which we face in our life is very little bit. 
so in that i always inspire from those people uh, not only from the uh, famous leaders i always uh, respect people always uh, see some whenever i feel uh, uh, no uh, no um, sad or something i uh, i feel not well then i go out and then make myself like that's a instant uh, uh, inspiration for me so that's all yeah thank you thank you so much to master michael i initially was thinking that okay where this is leading actually i mean uh, you, the moment you said that it comes the inspiration and suddenly goes but what a direction you given and what an in depth knowledge actually you shared with us the instance that we are privileged sometimes people who are not privileged what about them and what we are doing about it are we sitting and cribbing here or at least we are happy that we have something in life to move ahead thank you so much for uh, forcing my brain to think on those lines okay we'll uh, honoring the time let's take with the last question i saw meanwhile toastmaster i am assuming is uh, he's a toastmaster iram raised uh, his hand and then uh, is he in the room i don't see him now iram is not in the room uh, okay with us anymore okay no problem uh just master today do we have time can we can we take another topic that will be the last one uh just master thank you so much then okay to master shravan i see your hand raised are you there with us uh yes to master shruti i'm i'm here okay then let me know your take on the same that would you break the law to save your loved ones would you break the law to save your loved ones toastmaster shravan very tricky question fellow toastmasters and my dear guests would you break the law to save your loved ones i don't sure i don't because law is more stronger than my love because why because nature has its own law nature follows its own law if we don't align with that law we will definitely face lot of consequences not as an individual a collective collectively will face the face those consequences here i am mentioning the law that is defined by it's not the law defined by the human beings if the law of nature if anybody even my loved one is also uh, violating that law from the nature nature uh, nature's law everybody will face the consequences even if i save them by breaking the law we have to face the consequences so we have to go with the law of nature because of that i don't want to break the law for my loved ones instead i will try to make them realize what kind of consequences if we break together that kind of natural law so with that i would like to conclude over to you table topics master smriti thank you so much to master shravan and i completely agree that was a very tricky question to answer i just wanted to know your thoughts on the same and it's good to know a perspective towards a very tricky situation i don't know what an individual will do but you attempted to answer the same thank you so much and before we end the table topic segment i would request zoom moderator to spotlight diana so that i can read her beautiful table topic speech which she has written her topic was what makes you smile diana to which she answered thank you toast master table topic master my smile does make me feel inside good to this environment as the summer is raising now i have a great smile with bright teeth on my mouth and my that smile the best table topic 
I have my best smile on my face. Thank you so much from Diana. Diana, we can see that and it's not only you, it's you through which we keep on smiling in our meeting. Thank you so much for gracing us in every meeting, whichever is possible for you to attend. On that note, thank you so much for each and every uh, speaker who tried to attend the topic today. You give so much meaning, so much quotes, so much decoding, dissection of the quotes, and I had too much to carry forward from here. On that note, I would like to give the stage back to the Toastmaster of the day, Toastmaster Sovik. Please put your hands together for him and also for our speakers today. Welcome back, everyone. First of all, a huge round of applause to our Table Topics Master. I guess I have seen, the last time I had seen such topics were similar to the bouncers which Australian ballers bowl to our cricketers. While all the speakers, table topic speakers, were like Indian batsmen swatting them away. I'd also like to mention all the table topic uh, speakers who evidently who beautifully explained what life means to them. And I can definitely say I'm going to sit at night and wonder about these questions and what I would do with them. I would also like to thank Postmaster Diana, who ex evidently expressed her that we should all be smiling, showing our white teeth. And I'd like to welcome all on camera, everyone who is there on the meeting, just come on camera and we would like to see your beautiful smile. Uh, I'd like to ask to uh, the timer, are there any disqualifications in the section? No, no disqualification. No? Everyone was within the time limit, yeah. Very well. I would also like to ask the Zoom masters, are the polls ready for the table topic session? Uh, I would like to uh, just confirm from timer, do we have uh, uh, how many table topic speakers were there? Can, could you please confirm so I can uh, launch the poll? There were eight of them. Uh, um, Hello. You can continue yes. with your table, uh, uh, Timod. I will just uh, meanwhile launch the poll. Definitely. So while we go move to the next section, we will obviously, don't forget which table, to table topic speaker was the best because the polls will be coming up shortly, but be ready to move to the next section. Before we do that, we all have thought about our Toastmasters journey. We all have been there where we stand in front of the mirror reciting our speeches, writing our speeches, rewriting our speeches. But what about the next speaker is going to tell about her journey? Before that, I'd like to ask Toastmaster Shilpa, who will be evaluating our designated speaker, Toastmaster Fatima, could you confirm your presence? Um, yes, team, Muri, I'm here. Okay. Toastmaster Sovik, uh, yeah. can we go with the uh, panel discussion? Yeah. Uh, we are moving. Toastmaster Sovik? Yeah. We can go with panel discussion first. Okay, uh, just a second. I'm sorry to interrupt. Can we go ahead with the given change as as given, please? Because I need to handle other things. Is that all right? Um, I'm sorry. I was informed. I this Toastmaster Tarindu from District 32 Millennium Toastmasters. I was informed the panel discussion will be from 7:25 to 8:05. I'm really sorry. I've allocated my time according to that, and that's the time slot available for me to participate in the discussion. Sorry about that. Uh, so I can understand that we have a little bit of time crux. Uh, evaluate one, Toastmaster Shilpa, will you be uh, available just after the time slot? Uh, it, it might be tough, but I'll try. 20 it. minutes. It's all right. Yeah. Yeah. I'll okay. Be. Thank you for accommodating. So we'll move ahead uh, with the panel discussion. Um, again, just correcting myself. This is going to be about Toastmaster Yogita. If, uh, can can you can anyone just confirm? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. So uh, while we want to learn about our Toastmasters journey, we'll just have to sidetrack and learn about the secrets of being a speed champion. Well, who doesn't want to be a champion? And uh, apparently, we have someone who has the secrets to that. Before that, Toastmaster Mamta, who will be evaluating designated speaker, Toastmaster Yogita, could you confirm your presence? Yes, I'm here. Yes. Yogita is a go with the flow and joyful person, as we can see from her very lovely face. She has always been a people person and enjoying her face as an HR and image and soft skills trainer. 
beyond the nine to five hustle, you will find her dancing, reading mind bending books, exploring new places of experimenting with different foods. She'll be giving a level five project two of dynamic leadership with the project title, moderating a panel discussion. The purpose of this project is for the member to apply his or her skills as a public speaker and leader to facilitate a panel discussion. The timing for the speech is 20, 40 minutes. Best of luck, Toastmaster Yogita, Secrets of Speech Champions. Secrets of Speech Champions, Toastmaster Yogita. Thank you, Toastmaster of the Day, for the wonderful introduction. Good evening, everyone. And I hope you're all doing great as this evening is. Have you ever wondered what it takes to captivate an audience and deliver a perfect speech that leaves a lasting impact? Today, we are going to uncover the secrets behind such remarkable public speaking. If you are someone who would like to improve your public speaking skills, be it in any field, and want to know what makes a winning speech and how it resonates with everyone, how can you participate in future contests and have the crown of a winner? This discussion is for you. I am thrilled to welcome you all to our panel discussion Unlocking Public Speaking Success. We have a distinguished panel of international speech contest champions who will share the unique insights and experiences with us. I would request the audience to feel free to share their questions in the chat box at any time, and we would be addressing them during the Q&A session at the end. Let me introduce our esteemed panelists. First, we have Toastmaster Farvez Imamuddin from Candy Toastmasters Club, an accomplished coach and a trainer with over 3,000 years of experience. He was the second runner-up at the District 82 Humorous Speech Contest. Moving to our panelist two, we have Toastmaster Tharandu, a senior lecturer at the Postgraduate Institute of Management and a corporate coach. He is the District 82 champion for both the International Speech Contest and the Humorous Speech Contest in 2024. Joining us is also Toastmaster Ravi Uduwele from Pinnacle Toastmasters Club, the Group Chief Strategy Officer at Love Holdings Limited. Toastmaster Ravi has won the District 82 International Speech Contest and the Humorous Speech Contest for 2024. Finally. Uh, hi, Yogita. I'm sorry to interrupt. A small correction. Uh, Ravi is the 20, 2024 champ. I'm the 2023. Just a small correction. Sorry. Okay. All right. Noted. My error. And uh, so Toastmaster Tarandu is the winner in 2023 and Toastmaster Ravi is the champion for 2024. Finally, we have a DTM, Saurabh Datta, a double DTM from District 92. He is an entrepreneur and a seasoned public speaker with multiple accolades including the area contest winner in evaluation and table topics and the division contest winner for the international speech contest, division B, district 92, and a Gabby's club member. To start with, I would like each of you to briefly share what you believe is the most important element in delivering an impactful speech that resonates with the audience. Let's start with Toastmaster Farvis. Uh, you're on mute, Toastmaster, for these. Okay, uh, am I audible now? Yes. Yep. Okay, thank you very much. So, I mean, there are lots of elements uh, that will that that create an impactful speech. So it, you can't boil it to just one element. Uh, there are so many things that have to be combined to make a speech impactful, starting from knowing your audience to uh, uh, knowing what story or content would uh, relate or appeal to the audience and uh, then crafting your script in such a way and crafting your stories in such a way that uh, it will also it will both uh, logically and emotionally appeal to the audience and also finally to being able to deliver your speech authentically so that you can establish that connection with the audience. I think all these elements put together make an impactful speech. 
Excellent insights, Toastmaster Parviz, and I exactly agree with you. There are multiple elements that go while delivering an impactful speech. We should know what we are and what we are going to deliver. We, the audience should be able to relate. And the speech should be crafted in a way that it actually resonates logically and empathetically with the audience. Lastly, we have the authenticity that plays a key role. How about uh, your views on this, Toastmaster Tharindu? Yeah, I would uh, completely agree with uh, Favis. And first of all, Yogita, thank you very much for having me here. Absolute pleasure to be coming back to Gabby for the second time this week, actually. Uh, in my view, in addition to what Favi said, uh, you introduced me as a business lecturer. So I want to bring it with a bit of a business angle. Some of the most successful products in the world have been what has been produced when companies have been true to themselves, true to their heart. Apple, for example, they are true to their heart, they believe in innovation and the products they give are successful and it's adopted and accepted well worldwide. Similarly, even a speech, as Favi said, you need to look at what is the audience expecting? What are the jokes? What are the um, stories that the audience resonates with? What is trending right now? Personally, me, some of the things I add in division, I remove by a district semifinal because that particular thing is no longer trending by that time period. However, I believe one of the very important aspects of coming up with a speech that people would resonate is identifying what has had an impact in your life. What is the journey? What is the uh, problems, challenges you have been through? Because that way, when you build a speech based on that, with your life, with your life's experiences, what you've been through, when your story is based on that, it comes from the heart. And I believe anything coming from the heart, audience will feel it, they will receive it, and they will resonate and connect with it. So in my view, while you look at the outside and the audience, go deep into your heart. What is the story you have lived by? What is the story of your life? And what can we take from it? I would start from that point, just like how top brands in the world come up with products by being true to the heart of their thinking. Very rightly said, and pleasure is all mine, DTM Tarindu, uh, Toastmaster Tarindu, to have you here. Thank you for joining us. And yes, as you rightly mentioned, the you compared the storytelling with business, and that's correct. We need innovation to keep anything moving. Similarly, with the speech, we need to ensure what is the audience, what are their expectations, what are the current trends, and what is coming, what you are bringing out for them. Great. Let's hear from Toastmaster Ravi. Toastmaster Ravi, could you share your perspective on this? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, first of all, for having me, uh, Yogita. So while agreeing with both Farvez and Tarindu, let me also try to add my two cents. I think uh, simplicity is also very important because I don't think a Toastmaster audience would you know, want you to touch upon complex topics and give complex uh, solutions. They want simplicity. A simplicity both in the story as well as the language. So when I first joined Toastmasters, I thought, okay, this is a U.S. organization. You've got to speak, you know, complex English with complicated words. But over time, I understood, you no, know, it's not the complexity that connects with people, but it's the simplicity. So your word usage, stories that you bring in should should be something that connects with the audience. And I think uh, if you go through the world championship speeches, most of the speeches are on very, you know, day-to-day -to -day topics, right? They're not going to solve, you know, some uh, unresolved problems. It could be a relationship issue. It could be how to bring in happiness, how to, you know, pursue success, which are things that all of us aspire and, and are, you know, looking for answers in our day-to-day -day lives. So when you speak on such simple topics, it automatically connects with the audience and they can easily follow you. And as long as we uh, you know, are able to pull them also into our speech through the experiences that we provide uh, you know, uh, during our speech, I think uh, you know, the audience will be connected and they'll, they'll follow you to the end. So that's, that's my two cents on uh, you know, speeches. I absolutely agree with Toastmaster Ravi. Simplicity and authenticity is the one thing that every time goes hand to hand while delivering any speech. When you are able to relate anything with the audience, when it touches their heart, only then they are going to remember you. 
what a fine point brought by Toastmaster Ravi. All right, now let's hear from DTM Saurav. DTM Saurav, can I know what do you think, what makes the winning speech? What is the most important element? Okay, so before I mention that, first of all, I can't thank you for having me here. It will be like thanking my family for letting me have dinner at home. Uh, <laughs> so I'll skip that. Uh, but uh, what I can do say that I want to thank you for including me in this panel because I think I'm the only person here who has not won at the district contest but lost at the district contest. And as we all know, failure is a better teacher than success. So probably that's why you have included me in the panel. Nevertheless, thank you so much for um, having me here. And um, see, though I have, so this is my first year that I contested. Uh, the first contest that I did four years back doesn't count because I didn't even know uh, why we call it an evaluation speech contest. Uh, is it speech or evaluation? I didn't even know that, right? So uh, uh, this is my first contest for all practical purposes. But what I've done is in the last four years as a district officer, I was invited in many contests across the world where I've been a chief judge, voting judge, um, and various other contest official roles. Now, what I've observed, two things like what all the panelists mentioned, I'll just want to you know, talk about one, two important things. One is the message that we are delivering is what I've seen is very, very important. What is the end message, the takeaway? Like if you, for example, if I ask you, what was the key message that Dhananjay talked about? I see something. Manoj Vasudevan, less bent more. So every of these world champions, if you see, there is a key message that they have left us with. So that is one important thing. And the other thing that I that I feel as a contestant and as a contest judge that it is um, the impact that you are having on the audience. Both of that in combination is very important. What is the desired impact? What is the impact that you want to leave the audience with? And what is the impact you are finally leaving the audience with? So these are my two uh, learnings from the contests. Thank you. Well, uh, I would see, sincerely thank you for joining me on this panel discussion and accepting my invite. And yes, rightly said, though not said, but yes, humor, failure and role taking, they play a very vital role in doing in, in any field, we, whatever we do, be it the winning speech, be it the winning uh, field in whatever you're pursuing. All right. So uh, you mentioned that there are two things that play a very important role. One is what is the message that we are communicating? And second, how is it resonating with the audience? Moving ahead with this, Toastmaster Parviz, I would like to ask you in your experience as a master storyteller, as I discussed with you, I think you are as, I, I would label you as a master storyteller. What do you believe? How is delivering message and uh, resonating with the audience is more, very important or uh, Resonating audience with storytelling more important. Dostmasa Farviz, are you there? I'm there. Oh, I'm sorry. there. I I feel. I, yeah, I'm I'm constantly forgetting to unmute myself. <laughs> My okay. apologies. Uh, anyway, that's, that, that's okay. so kind of you to call me. Call me a master storyteller. So could you could you repeat your question once again so that I can grasp it clearly? So yes. Please. So um. Building upon what DTM sort of mentioned, that there are two key elements that play a vital role. Message that you have to convey and the audience that resonates. So what do you believe? How do we ensure that a message resonates with the audience? Well, uh, I think uh, the, the best way to ensure that a message resonates with the audience is to know the audience, you know, because... If, you, if you're asking me about resonating without knowing who the audience is, it's very difficult to craft uh, any speech that can actually relate to the audience. Um, so I, I, I completely agree with uh, what Ravi said. So when you when you speak to a Toastmasters audience, it's it's very important to keep your topics simple, not to speak about uh, topics that the audience might be divided or have divided opinions in. If you do that, you're running the risk of uh, dividing the audience in uh, either liking you or not liking you. So knowing the audience uh, and keeping it simple is key to ensuring that your message resonates 
with the audience. And on top of that, I believe uh, if, if you go one step further uh, and try to uh, ensure that your message sticks with the audience, it's, it's vital that you include storytelling in your speeches. And storytelling is not just, you know, picking any story from your life and just narrating that in your speech. It's to, it's to ensure that your story should have a suspense and a conflict that has to be resolved and a solution that you give that can be taken by the audience. So that's what a story is, uh, where you have a, a character that's facing a, a conflict, and then uh, it has to, the character has to overcome the conflict in, this, in such a way that uh, the solution should be actually something that can be taken by the audience without you forcing down their throat, uh, forcing it down their throat. So I think these two elements are very important to ensure that you know your audience, you study your audience to ensure that your message resonates with them, and also to ensure that you tell a story when you know your audience and make, making sure that you pick a story that any story, once you once you've picked your topic, you need to ensure that your story has a, a character, a setup, a conflict. Uh, and a solution uh, that can be actually passed over to the audience. Well, what I can summarize from your insights is that knowing the audience is the first step to do before venturing into any contest. Secondly, practicality and simplicity go hand in hand while going deeper into their hearts. Storytelling definitely plays a very vital role, but unless we are aware about who our audience is and what they would like to hear, I don't think we can build a storytelling that is going to impact. So Toastmaster Tharindu, just like Toastmaster Farbis mentioned about captivating storytelling, what are some common pitfalls that speakers might face when they try to craft powerful stories? And how do you think we can avoid them? I think, uh, Yogita, one needs to understand that it might be very hard to have one full story that everybody can connect with. And if you are trying to keep it 100% real and true, um, in my view, it's more of a 70-30 game. 70% 70 of your story can be real, but another 30%, you might have to add some of the words you might have to tweak. And there's no shame in that. It's, it's, uh, you're, you're tweaking the, story in a way so that people will connect with it better and it helps you to deliver your end message in a in a better way. And I've done so many speeches like that where it's gone 70-30. I'd love to say 70% real, 30% it added on. So common one common mistake people do is they try to wait for that perfect story in its entirety to make it ready for a speech. You know, some of the parts of your story you obviously might have to take it out due to practical reasons, due to reasons of not wanting to sideline a certain group of people. So it, it, is, uh, it, it is what it is. Secondly, another pitfall that, uh, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, you asked for the pitfalls, am I right? You asked correct. for the pitfalls. So another pitfall people face is they try to wait for that story with a perfect blend of humor and uh, the mistakes and that excitement, that's never thats never going to happen. In, in, in our life, if you look at, uh, it's very hard to think of one single day where we would have had the perfect balance of uh, humor and excitement, failure. It, it's not going to happen. Karan Johar is not writing our uh, destiny or our life, you know, so it's never going to happen. That's why don't wait for that perfect one perfect story. In, instead, bring in multiple stories, the good moments, the bad moments, the sad moments, the ugly moments. Bring all that. Pick what's best and craft that story because it's still your story. It's still your own experiences. So I would say bring out multiple stories and, and then connect them together, parts of it, and then you will have your best uh, story to share. Uh, the third pitfall is sometimes you might get carried away by your story, and you might forget the most important uh, part when it comes to a speech contest, which is your score sheet. And it's a mistake I've done very, I would say regularly, too frequently to be honest. Focus on the score sheet. I listen to speeches which are extremely emotional. Everybody gets up and claps. 
but not even ranked in the top three. Because it, people would later say, look, great speech, but that would have scored zero for humor. Great speech, but that would have scored zero for vocal variety. And there itself, you are looking at 40, 50 marks out. So, yes, you, you may have won the hearts, uh, like, like some cricket teams these days. You win hearts, but unfortunately, you don't have the trophy to hold. So that's the important thing. Make sure your speech, your story is actually having enough to score on that score sheet. So as you write the story, have the score sheet with you. If uh, I have a group of Toastmasters who constantly guide me to stop my speeches from becoming overly humorous because end of the day, humor also only gets you like 20, 30 points. Uh, so it's, it's important that you make sure you avoid that pitfall of going into in one extreme too much and missing out on the score sheet. So that's my take on three common pitfalls to avoid. Well, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing such a wonderful strategy, Toastmaster Sarindu, and it is really crucial to be aware about those pitfalls. So 70-30% is the rule that you suggest we must go for. And we cannot avoid pitfalls, but we need to be aware by actually focusing on the actual combination of the practical scorecard measurements. And we cannot run after the perfect story. Thank you. Moving on, Toastmaster Ravi. I would like to ask you, as uh, uh, he meant, uh, as Toastmaster Tarindu mentioned, that he has uh, he has seen multiple story, uh, multiple people delivering stories, but not scoring well, and that brings to a limelight another important feature that is the feedback. So before we uh, go on how the evaluation is done on the district level or on the Toastmaster level, can you tell me? Uh, if feedback is not resonating with you, if feedback can sometimes be conflicting, correct? How will you prioritize what pieces of feedback you will incorporate into your speech to give the story which resonates with the audience plus you score well in the uh, in the Toastmasters contest, international contest? Yeah, I think uh, all of us would agree that feedback uh, plays an important role in your growth as a speaker and also your you know script development. But as you very correctly said, uh, sometimes feedback can be conflicting. Uh, so what I used to do was, you know, if I were to deliver a speech at a club, probably I'll hand over a you know, feedback sheet to everyone and get feedback from about 20, 25 people in the club and collate them, right? So if I find feedback that is very common across, you know, a lot of people, then I... Uh, put a bigger weight on that because it's a common feedback point, common observation point, right? Uh, also, I put in more weight for experienced people because, uh, you know, they've been in the club or in Toastmasters for a longer period of time. And I believe they are in a better position to provide uh, good feedback. So that will also play in, in terms of uh, weighting. Uh, but... Sometimes what happens is uh, there are some isolated pieces of feedback which are not very common, which you can ignore. But sometimes uh, it could also be that these isolated pieces of feedback are the most important because not everyone can give you a wow factor in your speech. So you can't completely discard because it's isolated. It can be that thing, that, that wow factor that you were looking for all this time. So it's very important to go through all the uh, pieces of feedback that you receive. And it's up to you to weigh in and see, you know, which feedback that you really need to take in and incorporate as you go along and which feedback probably to discard. And also beyond your club is, you know, is another a space that you can explore in other clubs or other forums where you can do the same speech and see whether that feedback coincides with uh, what you already got, where there are common feedback, there are additional feedback points. So I think it's a continuous process that you have to, uh, you know, go through. It's not that you can uh, get uh, one feedback, you know, on one day and just forget about it, but it's a continuous refinement from club to area to division to district because the competition gets uh, tougher and then you need all the feedback possible for you to grow as a speaker and also to keep improving your script. So that is how I approach it. 
All right. So that's very, very essential to note down. And that's a great point brought up by you, Toastmaster Ravi. We might get contradictions when we only go for one evaluation, but definitely if we are asking for more than one evaluation, as in we can approach 10 to 20 people for that feedback and focus on common observations, definitely we can focus what is the area of improvement and we can work towards improvis improvising that. And yes, it is a continuous process. Moving on to DTM Saurav, as Toastmaster Ravi mentioned, it's a continuous process. And, uh, but uh, if feedback, so when we get it, do you also ensure that you practice your speech in different clubs to understand if the evaluation in the different clubs would be different or do you practice it only at specific clubs? You practice your speech everywhere. Uh, so it's not about different clubs or specific clubs. I think different set of evaluators, different kind of evaluators that we should look for. Because if you are only practicing in, in the clubs are not very important. What is important is the profile. Because remember that the voting judges will come from different backgrounds, right? There will be voting judges who have, all, who have always contested from day one in Toastmasters and there will be voting judges who have never contested. There will be voting judges who are in their 20s, 30s, 40s and voting judges in the 60s, 70s and 80s. There will be voting judges uh, from different parts of the country, maybe different parts of the world. Um, there are uh, voting judges um, who have different points of view, um, male, female, for instance, that could be another be factor. So practicing in front of a diverse set of evaluators always help. If you're just practicing in front of a particular club or a particular kind of evaluator, then you get only a particular kind of feedback. That makes it very limited. So uh, that's what I tried to do. Interestingly, in my case, I want to add something to what, uh, you know, what Ravi and Tarindu mentioned before this. I did get, uh, so, um, you know, to be very honest, even before I went to the district contest stage, I knew that my win probability is very less for a very uh, important reason that I got a consistently a feedback that my speech first makes people laugh and then it makes it cry, make them cry. And uh, that is not something that all my evaluators consistently said that will not fly for uh, a district contest for the simple reason that you cannot leave them with a sense of hopelessness. You have to leave them with a sense of hope. But I still could not incorporate the feedback for the simple reason that it. I took the feedback very late in the day. So this feedback actually came in probably around a couple of weeks before the contest. By then I have kind of lived the speech, I've ate the speech, drank the speech, walked the speech, talked the speech. And at that point of time, if I would have tried to change the speech, it would have been a disaster. So one thing what I understood is that I will um i you know i may not win but i still wanted to give it a try with that particular format because as someone mentioned that you know it, it may have won the heart but you did not win the trophy and that is something that um probably happened with me as well because i got a very good response from the audience for people even after the speech was over dhananjay was there sabine hegre was there and they, they both uh, talked about you know how it was so touching and all of that which is fine all that is good words but at the end of the day i did not win and part of that is because i was too late to take the feedback i think it's important you start taking the feedback from very early on as soon as you win at the club level so don't wait till the division level you know after that i'll reach out to other people i think that was a wrong strategy on my part i should have started reaching out to those people just as soon as I won at the club level. So that's my learning from this contest. Thank you. So uh, that was an excellent insight, DTM Saurav. What I have understood is that different setups brings out different perspectives and different perspectives helps you further enhance your speech. What uh, makes me ask you one more question is that that is very, uh, that's very generous of you to share what went wrong with your speech and you came to know about it. Still, you could not change it at last level because there was no time for preparation, understood. But you also mentioned that you have to ensure that your message is not only heard, but felt. And in this speech, you had your message clearly heard and felt, but it could not resonate. Could you share an example of a speech where you have successfully achieved this? Um. So just a week before that, so see this, this, it did resonate. I would not say it did not resonate, but it did not leave the impact that you would want to leave. You know, my speech had a very sad ending. Someone died. And the description and everything was very extremely heartfelt. And uh, people literally, I mean, people actually came and told me that I cried at the end of your speech. But I can't, I heard someone telling someone else in the hall that I can't get out of this speech for a few weeks. 
it was that deep in terms of the sorrow the sorrow that i created uh, which i feel very guilty about you know i was telling someone that i feel like the pipe piper of hamlin who used humor to bring the audience together i took them near a deep dark well and then i threw them inside the dark well and said okay by now i'm going that's how my speech was you know everyone laughed they came with me to the well and then they were left in the darkness so it did resonate with the audience but that's not how they would want to be resonated with you don't want to walk out with a sense of despair guilt uh, hopelessness so it's not about resonating it's about the impact that i'm talking about uh, on the other hand just one couple of weeks before i was a test speaker at another district conference evaluation speech contest and there i gave a speech on uh, in the evaluation speech contest i gave a speech on evaluation itself and it was more like a roast speech where i basically roasted the evaluators it was absolutely humorous all throughout and uh, it resonated with the audience it resonated with the evaluators they uh, found it tough to uh, um, you know evaluate me but it did definitely uh, you know kind of helped uh, in terms of resonating with them okay what i understand is that you it's very inspiring to see how well you connect with your audience and then you know everybody wants to laugh at the end of the day and it is very very essential that you can imply humor even at the evaluation and then you they won't even feel bad so that is what we call a perfect roast now moving ahead to toastmaster tharindu uh, and since he has to uh, also leave uh, early, I would request we would be uh, winding up the session and I would again remind the audience to drop the questions in the chat box. Toastmaster Tharindu, how does the Toastmasters contest experience vary across different countries and districts? And what unique challenges or opportunities have you encountered? So I when I started competing in Toastmasters, uh, Sri Lanka was a part of... Uh, I would say entire South India and Sri Lanka were one district way back in 2014. And uh, over the years, then it was only Sri Lanka and uh, I believe Tamil Nadu. And then it was only Sri Lanka by itself. So it's, technically, it's with two countries that I've experienced this. Um, however, as someone who's been following and checking out a lot of the other contests, I think what, because the audience varies so much, so do the judges. And you can sometimes, like end of the day, contest is a judge's game. Uh, we are, we are, we are, this is a very, I would say, this is a technical sport with a lot of subjective judgment. The entire audience might think you, you did really well and you should be on top, but that may not be what that 20, 30 or 10, 11 judges thought. And then if, if that's the case, then it's not your day. But what I've seen is that from a cross-cultural angle, uh, the words, one thing is might have to differ. Like if you're looking at a predominantly uh, USA uh, audience, it's not, you don't use words like uh, elevator, it's more like lift. And uh, so there are there are different words which we can change, number one. Uh, point number two is when, when you're having compete in different countries, like you take, for example, Sri Lanka and India both, I personally, when I, when I take a certain speech to, to, to make it more suitable to an Indian audience, I might I might include some Indian references, Indian examples. I remember um, once I, I, I said I, I felt like I went from being uh, a king uh, king of Atlantis uh, towards uh, being like feeling like being King Pulakesi because I, I, I wanted to say how, how I went from being really at the top into the feeling like a joke. So what is it that the audience, this international audience you are trying to speak to, what are they following? What are they resonating with? And then you obviously, you need to tweak that accordingly. And judges will expect different things. They will have different, uh, completely different expectations. Uh, they might have completely different viewpoints of things. So I think the game gets uh, quite interesting when it goes to an international level. And then now with video judging, your videos will be sent to people to be judged for international semifinals and that will be from a mix. So I think what's important is that you speak the global language, you speak a globally common sensitive problem with examples that anybody anywhere in the corner can refer to, can relate to. That gives you, a, 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 I believe, 
more mileage and better legs for your speech to travel the distance in the contestant. Um, once again, Yogita, thank you so much for having me and uh, it was an absolute pleasure being a part of this. Wish, wish you good luck. Thank you, Toastmaster Tarindu, and it was an absolute pleasure having you here. And uh, I completely agree, you have certain other commitments, and it was really lo lovely to have you here. We would be continuing with the other panelists, and it's okay if you would like to drop out. Uh, thank you so much. So, actually, actually it's, a, it's a Toastmaster installation related commitment, which I need to attend of my own club. So that's why. Thank you. But definitely, I wouldn't stop you there. All the best. Thank you so much for joining us here. All right, uh, moving ahead with where Toast Masatarindu left us is that wordplay plays a really important role. And demography, we should be always aware about what is the demography you're delivering the speech in. Everyone's perspective is different. Global problems can be the solution to whatever, global problem can be the solution to deliver that speech which can resonate with everybody. Now, I would like to understand, Toastmaster Farvees, any concluding thoughts you would like to uh, share with us on this, about the discussion we have had just right now? Post that, we would be moving to the audience questions, if any. Okay, right. Um, so it's been a it's been a fruitful discussion with, uh, with a lot of uh, rich contributions from, I think, uh, all three of my colleague panelists. Uh, so we spoke about, I, I would like to uh, uh, pick on a, uh, three uh, important elements. One is uh, what Ravi spoke about, uh, feedback. And uh, second is what uh, DTM uh, Saurabh Datta and uh, Tharindu mentioned. Uh, that's, uh, you know, that, that you should actually make, uh, speak to the ballot as well. Although your speech is emotional, it's very important to speak to the ballot too. And three, the, the mindset. Uh, so uh, when, when uh, so I'll, I'll start with the uh, feedback first. You know, when you're, when you're entering a contest, uh, after you initially write your speech, it's very important uh, that you ensure that your speech is appealing to a wide variety of audience because you have two kinds of audience that you need to focus on when it comes to a contest. One is the audience at large, and two is the is is the judging panel. So it's not enough that you convince or persuade or appeal to the audience. It is also important that you convince and persuade and appeal to the judges as well. So it's it, it, it's very important to strike this balance. So while may, ensuring that you hit all the right notes in the ballot sheet, it is also important that you uh, reach out to the wider audience because the laughs and the response, everything comes from the wider audience. So it's, it's, it's uh, crucial to uh, maintain this balance. So my, my suggestion would be uh, in, in, in maintaining that balance to identify the people you get feedback from. Ensure that you get feedback from people who have been chief judges, who have been judging contests, and also uh, who are among the general audience, but who can give you actual vital, critical, uh, and uh, constructive feedback. Two is uh, the, the fact that you need to be able to make sure not just give an emotional speech, but also uh, end your speech in, in such a way that it would have uh, hit all the boxes in the ballot. So yes, you might like uh, certain elements of your speech like DTM sort of uh, had liked, but end of the day, it is not about me, it's about the audience. So we say, you know, if, although you like certain elements in your speech, just kill your babies, right? You might love the babies in your speech, but just kill them for the sake of appealing to the audience. So it's, it's while ensuring that you emotionally appeal to the audience, that, 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 I mean, sto stories have to emotionally appeal, and that message could only stick if the emotions are right, uh, uh, rightly struck. But it, it is also very important that you don't leave the audience on uh, uh, on, a, on a very uh, low note. That they are so sad and depressed that uh, you might not be able to lift them back to give you that response. So while while giving an emotional speech, it is also important to ensure that you bring them back to life and end your speech with a, a very positive and a happy note so that th th their response would be something of uh, something more positive uh, than negative. And uh, three, 
Okay. Finally, the mindset. I think the mindset that you need to have is the uh, is the will to do your best at the speech spe uh, speech contest, not to win. I don't think anyone should contest to win because you can, only one person can win in the end of the day. But when you do your best, the chances are that you might get that trophy, right? I mean, let's not deny that all of us are craving for that world championship trophy. But end of the day, only one person is going to get it. But everyone else is guaranteed to grow if we go with that mindset to do your best. So those are the three points I would like to leave you with. Thank you very much. Thank you, Toastmaster Farvees. And indeed, you summarized the entire discussion perfectly well. And I was expecting just a small uh, conclusion. And thank you so much for bringing that to my notice. Feedback, speaking from the heart and resonating with the audience by analyzing the demographics, strike the hammer on the emotions, find out what exactly is that going on. Uh, Toastmaster Ravi, quick, could you quickly uh, share some concluding remarks in 30 seconds because we have questions popping up from audience and we have a red card already showing up. So I do not want it to. Exactly. Yeah, as, con as a concluding remark, I, I would like the contestants to ask uh, why they are competing but not everyone competes to win. So uh, as a new contestant, I, when I started contesting, it was all about uh, being someone better as a speaker. You know, there was a brilliant speaker in your country called Sunil Nair when I first joined uh, in, in the club in New Delhi. I had no intention of winning better because I, I knew for a fact that I couldn't get past uh, Sunil Nair. But the simple fact that competing with him on the same stage, I knew I could uh, be better. So at that moment in time, that was my why or what my aspiration was. But uh, two, three years down the line was only when I thought, okay, I also can make a name for myself. I also can win. So your aspirations will also continue to evolve. Uh, your desires will continue to evolve. And it's always good to ask, keep asking yourself, why are you in this? Why are you competing? And uh, winning might not be the only answer. There could be other reasons. And whatever the reasons may be, uh, just you know, pursue your aspirations and dreams and uh, be whoever you want to become. Thank you. Exactly right. The why for anything is very important. Identify the why and understand why you are wanting to do that why. Moving on to Dutiam Saurav, please share some concluding remarks so in I'll less than 30 seconds. What Ravi said, and my why was very clear. Uh, I wanted, I the message that I shared is actually, a, it was a true story. And the message is also something. So my speech was about uh, apologizing to people that mean to you, even if you are not wrong, but just apologizing so that the relationship or lives can be saved. And a very dear friend of mine, he actually committed suicide because of something like this. And I so wanted to say that, I tell that speech. I read, I read somewhere that, uh, you know, if you are ever getting an opportunity to go on this stage uh, and you've got the whole world listening to you, which is that one message you want to give without dying before dying and that was the message i wanted to give and the second reason was that i wanted to try things that i'm not comfortable with humor uh, i'm very bad at humor i am very bad at role plays and these are the things i incorporated in my speech in my division contest i was contesting against a gentleman called kvm kishore i've actually uh, seen him in toastmaster contest when i was division director area director and I love the way he speaks, you know, his comedy. And so contesting against him was a big why for me. Uh, and uh, I decided to contest. And surprisingly, I won in the division contest. And I don't know how it was possible. Uh, because I absolutely thought that KVM was brilliant. But it happened, like, as they say, that day, the judge, that, was, that day was my day. And um, so everyone loved KVM's speech and I won. So the district was the other story. So my why from the very beginning was to overcome some of these organic challenges that I have in terms of humor, in terms of role plays, and also to get that experience because I knew it very well that if I win beyond anything beyond division, that would be a surprise or even after the division. So I was very clear that it was not for that that I'm there. So yeah, so that's my why. So I would really second your uh, opinion with what Toastmaster Ravi mentioned. The intention has to be clear and your intention was obviously clear from the start. We, one, one thing that I am going to incorporate in myself now, try something uncomfortable to make yourself better. Okay, so 
time for the question answer and we have a question from toastmaster bindu uh, toastmaster ravi you can take this question how do you bridge the ethics of crafting a message that resonates with the judges and delivering a message you passionately wish will resonate with an audience i'll repeat it for you how do you bridge the ethics of crafting a message that resonates with the judges and delivering a message you passionately wish will resonate with an audience am i clear i i am not very clear about the ethics part because uh, i don't think uh, anyone's doing unethical but i think uh, the question is basically how to win both the judges as well as the audience right um right so i think if you can deliver something that uh, resonate with an audience i mean judges are also part of an audience uh, i mean they are also humans so if you if you give a compelling message or a compelling story they would also resonate but i think to win over the judges you should clearly know what the ballot is also uh, i mean how the ballot works because uh, it's not always about the story or the message but then there are other elements right it could be the speech value could be your structure it properly body language vocal variety which may not be captured by the general audience because they don't have a ballot in hand they might solely look at the uh, story and the message but the moment you have the ballot you got to tick them off so that's why as a speaker once you're done with your story once you're done with your script then you have to ha have it you know alongside your ballot and see uh, how will you score in the ballot and if you don't see it for yourself probably you might have to get feedback from others ask your mentors your seniors to see how will i get scored so i think if you do that process i think you can bridge that gap between the audience and and your judges excellently portrayed toastmaster ravi and as yes, i do agree understanding the audience is not very easy we all have different perspectives and we do not know what is the pain point for anyone so it's all trying and testing but yes today we have incorporated many strategies which can help us win the speech contest and i wish to see more of the people contesting in the like uh, contesting for the district 92 as well as for the district 82 unfortunately that's all the time we have now i would like to thank our panelists toastmaster parvis our panelists who left toastmaster tarendu toastmaster ravi and dtm sarav for sharing their wisdom and experiences with us we have learned about a lot the importance of storytelling how to avoid common pitfalls the 70 30 strategy 70 ratio 30 strategy what is the value of the feedback how can you connect is this the last message you want to leave your audience with those master parvis highlighted the critical element of authenticity those master tarendu he provided valuable insights about uh, avoiding pitfalls Toastmaster Ravi emphasized the importance of prioritizing feedback. Mental preparation is what comes in, is what important. And DTM Saurav has encouraged us how to ensure that your message can resonate emotionally with the audience. Planning and preparing is the only strategy which I am going to take it as a sure sure guarantee for winning in any contest. Thank you, our audience, for your active participation and engaging question. we hope this discussion has provided everyone with practical tips and inspiration to enhance your public speaking journey have a great evening over to you tm ori thank you everyone thank you very much yogita thank you yogita thank you yogita thank you toastmaster yogita thank you all the panelists we often forget why we joined toastmasters maybe in the beginning it was just to speak better maybe it was just to overcome our confidence but with the toastmaster yogita's panel discussion i realized i need to aim higher i need to look for contests i need to participate in them and who better to learn from the winners itself each one of the panelists provided us with something a secret something which we knew but we couldn't implement this stage the gabby stage gives us a opportunity to become a better version for ourselves thank you so much speaker next up we move Next up, we move to our next speaker, who takes us to a very nostalgic topic: our own Toastmasters journey. Let's put our hands together for Toastmaster Fatima. But before that, 
we have Toastmaster Shilpa who will be evaluating a designated speaker. Could you confirm your presence? I'm here, Ram. Thank you. Yeah. Toastmaster Patima Atia is studying electrical engineering at the Institute of Technology, University of Moratua. Currently the VPPR of Sunday Live Speakers Forum. She is attempting her level five project one of presentation mastery path and the project title is Prepare to Speak Professionally. The purpose of this project is for the member to practice developing and presenting a longer speech. The timing for the speech is 18 to 20 minutes. Best of luck, Toastmaster Fatima. Toastmaster Journey. Toastmaster Journey. Toastmaster Fatima. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Uh, give me a second to share my screen. Oh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Hello, Toastmasters. Do you know about Toastmasters? I'm pretty sure that some of them are thinking that uh, what a kind of foolish girl that I'm. I. She's standing in front of a Toastmaster meeting virtually and asking from the audience, do you know about Toastmasters? Hello, Toastmasters guest. I'm pretty sure that in this uh, Toastmaster meeting, there are district champions, then division directors, area directors, then executive committee members, and also mutual joint members and guests. Especially mutual joint members and guests have a less knowledge about Toastmasters. And other district officials have a very well-known knowledge about Toastmasters. So today my present presentation is divided, mainly divided to two parts. First, I'm going to talk about what is Toastmasters, especially why we need to join with Toastmasters and what are the missions, core values and pathways. And the second part is about my Toastmaster journey. My dear friends, do you know about Toastmasters? Yeah. That's I asked question earlier in your. Toastmasters International is a non-profit education organization. And especially, we join Toastmasters to build our confidence and it teach public speaking skills and it is a worldwide network. And it has a very supportive community and members prepare and deliver their speeches and respond impromptu questions and uh, speeches like table topics and give and receive constructive feedbacks like evaluation sessions. So through this regular practice, the members are empowered to meet personal and professional communication goals. So my dear friends, this Toastmasters founded in 1924, and there are approximately 270,000 members in more than 14,200 clubs in around 148 country, 48 countries. So my dear friends, why we need to join with Toastmasters? Because we know Toastmasters is the learning never stops. And from joining Toastmasters, definitely, you can build your self-confidence and self-awareness. You can enjoy your ultimate personal growth. You can increase your leadership skills and it helps you to build your leadership skills. Improve your public speaking skills and avoid your fear of public speaking. And you can identify your potential and you can maximize your potential and also gain a competitive advantage in the workplace. So there are more many advantages, benefits in joining Toastmasters. What about Toastmasters? Do you know about the mission of Toastmasters? I'm sure that normally you all know about club mission. But do you know about Toastmasters International Mission and the district mission? In Toastmasters International Mission, they said 
we empower individuals to become more effective communicators and leaders. Then district mission, they said we build new clubs and support all clubs in achieving excellence. Then club mission, club mission normally you all heard, we provide a supportive and positive learning experience to the members and they develop the communication and the leadership skills and resulting in a greater self-confidence and personal growth. When you become a Toastmaster, definitely you need to know about core values. Especially, there are four main core values. Can you remember those core values? Integrity, respect, service, and excellence. If you are a Toastmaster, definitely you need to know about these core values. And finally, our pathways. When we, you are a paid member, definitely you, need, you can enter for a pathway, educational goal site. Then there are 11 pathways. Definitely, if you are doing a pathway, you know what, uh, what have there. there are many paths in this Toastmasters pathway learning experience. In my screen, you can get some ideas about these pathways. What dynamic leadership, motivational strategies, leadership development, persuasive influence, presentation mastery, strategic relationship, team collaboration, engaging humor. So if you are, if you need to increase your leadership skills, you can choose dynamic leadership. If you need to increase your presentation skills, you can choose presentation mastery. So now we are thinking how we can join for a pathway experience. If you are a paid member of a club, Definitely, you can go for the pathway experience. You can choose what you need to improve skills. That means you need to improve your presentation skills. You can choose presentation mastery, leadership skills. If you need to increase your humor side, you can choose engaging humor pathway. So choosing one pathway. So each path, they have five levels. And all uh, pathways have challenging projects. So the one common thing of each pathway is each path starts with an icebreaker. All pathways starts from icebreaker. What is icebreaker? Icebreaker means when a new, newly joined member uh, doing her first project in, the, uh, in front of the club members. That means that member introducing her or herself to the club members. And then at the end of that project, definitely he or she will break his ice and other members get to know about her or his self. And finally, recognition for each level will be completed. That means if you complete a path, they, you will, uh, they will issue a uh, certificate. That means level one achieve, level two achieve, likewise. And also the VPPR also, that means Vice President Public Relation will issue a, certificate, uh, issue a flyer and publish in your IP linking Instagram pages. So normally from each level is what you can get. If you complete level one, definitely you can master the fundamentals. Then level two, you can learn what's your style. After completing your level three, you can increase your knowledge about that pathway. Then level four, also you can uh, know about can into your skills. Then when you complete a pathway, definitely you are demonstrating the expertise from that pathway. So my dear friends, now I will move to my next part. It is about my Toastmaster journey. You can be, you can see my screen. There are WH questions. What's going on? Why I put WH questions in my screen? How, when, why, who, what? Now some are thinking what's going on. So today I'm describing my Toastmaster journey using those WH questions. So let's go. How I got to know about Toastmasters. It's a very uh, interesting story. That means when I was uh, so yeah in my uh, A levels after completing my A levels, my friends they were joining for English courses in ESOP to British way for four months six month courses. So I also need to improve my English skills. 
and those days I was very shy character and I won't come for in front of the audience and I won't speak uh, much more. So I always uh, say no for opportunities. I won't grab opportunities. So however, I just need to want improve my English knowledge. Because sometimes it is uh, due to less English knowledge, it is difficult to communicate with others. So I just uh, asked from my cousin sister, uh, she's Toastmaster Zahra Manzuk. Uh, now she's the area director of H3. So those days she is the vice president membership of Putland Toastmasters Club. So she, she told me, uh, Nangi, just join with Toastmasters. No need to join for a course because uh, when you join for a course, finally you will get a certificate. Uh, but for a lifelong experience, if, if you need to get a lifelong experience and if you can improve your English language, your spoken skills, spoken skills, then your leadership skills, just join with Toastmasters, just join one day, don't need to speak, just join and listen and uh, see what's going on. See, but uh, I don't actually, I don't know what is Toastmasters also. So that day only I heard about Toastmasters. So finally I joined Toastmasters because I can't say no to her. So I say, yes, okay, however, She's forcing me to join Toastmasters. However, I joined Toastmasters. So finally, when I joined Toastmasters, so I joined Toastmasters, I became a Toastmaster since June 2020. So due to my cousin sister forcing me to join Toastmasters, so I joined Toastmasters. Actually, why I joined Toastmasters? Because I don't know jo uh, what's Toastmasters, but I heard Toastmaster from her. So I know that I need to improve my English speaking skills, then public speaking skills, and I uh, avoid, I, uh, I'm always fear to speak in front of audience, so I need to avoid this matter, and I need to communicate with others because I am a very shy character. So I have uh, some points. So my cousin sister told me, join with Toastmasters. Yes. So now you already know who helped me to join Toastmasters. She helped me to join with Toastmasters. So finally, what had I learned from Toastmasters? So definitely, a few months going, then year, two years, now I think it's my fourth year. So definitely, it helped me to improve my public speaking skills. And it helped me to avoid my fear of public speaking because today I am so confidently speaking in front of this audience. So it also, I participate in many contests. And it helped me to improve my time management skills. Also, I be a part of my executive committee. So it helped me to teach uh, how to uh, work with, um, with the team, how to uh, do those works. And it improved my self-confidence. And also, it helped me to uh, grab opportunities. So finally, it helped totally, it changed my attitudes. So I'm here, I need to share that through these uh, three, four years, what positions that I did in Toastmasters. So probably 75% in my Toastmaster journey, I served as Vice President Public Relation. So first uh, in 21, 22 tenure, I was the Vice President Public Relation of Kuliapti Toastmasters Club. Then I haven't any skills in uh, flyer making. I, have, I didn't know anything about flyer making. So after joining Toastmasters, I learned Canva and I uh, got to know about uh, Canva software and how to create flyers. So after that, I got a golden opportunity that I uh, got to uh, got to serve with a public relations officer in Division HPR team. It was a golden opportunity. I got uh, I worked with um, senior Toastmasters and I got to know many uh, PR skills and how to create those. Uh, advanced flyers, so it it another golden opportunity. And uh, after that, I just uh, changed my path. I uh, took secretary of Kuliapiti Toastmasters Club. So Kuliapiti Toastmasters Club is my home club. So after that, uh, it changed the name as Sunday Live Speakers Forum. So now currently in this 22, 23, 24 tenure, I was the vice president public relation of Sunday Live speakers for. So I'm here to share that 
some flyers that I created in my VPPR journey. So some uh, keynote flyers, then thank you flyers, meeting flyers. Uh, then these flyers uh, I created when I was as the member of the division HPR team. So announcing the district officials, then we organize a speech craft program, then announcing those keynote speakers, then birthday flyers and meeting flyers. And also uh, when we are doing a contest, contest flyers, joint meeting flyers, new member orientation, moment of truth. Then finally, I, I got another opportunity that uh, when I was the VPPR of Kuliapiti Toastmasters Club, we organized the installation ceremony. It was uh, held on online virtual background. So then VPPR have more work. So I can remember I created 40 or 35 flyers because we need to uh, uh, send invitations to all the chief guests and district officials. So I created invitations separately, then a common invitation, then virtual backgrounds for executive committee members, and a thank you flyer, then agenda, all VPPR works done by myself. So it's also another experience in my VPPR journey. And uh, there are many occasions uh, happen and normally we know we are uh, creating flyers, then uh, Ramazan, Hindu Sinhala and Hindu Nivya. Then uh, we are promoting our club, then we need to uh, create flyers. Then when a member complete a pathway, we need to create a flyer. So many kinds of flyers. And another opportunity that I got that to create the newsletter. Uh, in, when I was in Kuliapati Toastmasters Club, I got a chance to uh, be a part, part of these two newsletters, Beyond Words 1 and 1 2. Uh, so then I was a member also in that team. And after we came for Sunday Lab Speakers Forum, we created our first newsletter, Sunday Horizons. It also, the editor was my, myself. So it's also another uh, opportunity and another experience that I gained from my Toastmaster, Vice President, uh, Public Relations uh, journey. The other thing is achievements that I got from Toastmaster. Actually, uh, I participated in international humorous evaluation contests in area level. Uh, and also international speech contest and human speech contest in 2021. Uh, I got uh, faces in club level and area level. Uh, so club level, I was the first runner up and the area level, second runner up. So actually I include those photos, just encourage yourself because uh, participation also a kind of a winning. So just participate and get that experience and learn from your senior Toastmasters. Learn their experience and enjoy your that moment because we can get to know when uh, contesting other members, how they prepare for that contest and their experience. We can we can take uh, we can take those things to our life. So just participate and enjoy that moment and uh, prepare more and more and do your best. So they are a newly joined member in this uh, meeting, definitely he or she can get some uh, motivation from my presentation, definitely, because just participate and get that experience and enjoy that moment because there are different stories in that platform. You can learn a lot of things from there. So these are different occasions that I participate in different contests. Uh, And I want to talk, what are the opportunities that I got from Toastmasters? Actually, I was a very shy character and I won't come in front of an audience and I am not much enthusiastic those days. But after joining Toastmasters, it changed me totally in different, it changed my attitudes. So I got chance to be a member of marketing team, Hot Shots here in conference in Division H, which held this uh, March, and member of marketing team, Media Conference Division H. Uh, so we, in this uh, hot shot year, we, our team, um, IEN, there are four more members. Our team, we created more than 72 flyers for this event. And uh, MC in officer training program in Division H. And MC in Unfold 2022 joint division conference. And also many uh, celebrations like Singhal and Bolivia. Just enjoy that moment. That means and get that experience. So this uh, picture is, I was delivering a speech in the Vyanda University. 
and he's done for 2022 joint year con uh, joint division conference so these pictures are some of that doing my mcs and uh marketing teams marketing uh join as a marketing member and this is Tinghala here, Tamil media celebration, and enjoy with that uh, other club Toastmasters and get a fun with them. So finally, uh, I want to say, I took two quotes from the internet because those quotes do uh, touch my heart very deeply. Success is not about perfection. It's about progress. Definitely, if you are improving day by day, definitely you are a success person. And there are no secrets to success. It is the results of preparation, hard work, and learning from failures. So always learn from your failures, be prepared, do hard work, and always grab opportunities. Don't miss any opportunities. If you can, if you can participate, definitely grab opportunities. Create more and more opportunities. Also, I want to say, today also another opportunity. So Gabby's Toastmasters Club, online club, Give me an opportunity to be a, a keynote speaker in this online uh, sector. So thank you for that opportunity. Over to you, uh, Toastmaster of the day. Thank you, Toastmaster, for a wonderful speech. Uh, being a VPPR member of a club, I can understand the amount of uh, posters we have to make, the amount of videos and you know all kind of media things which we have to make. So I can definitely understand your effort. But looking back at your Toastmaster journey, we all feel, I wish I have a presentation as similar as yours, showcasing my journey too. Thank you so much. We move on to our next speaker. Uh, before that, Toastmaster Smruti will be evaluating designated speaker, the distinguished Toastmaster Saurabh. Could you confirm your presence? Yes, I'm here. DTM Saurav Dutta is a winner of two distinguished Toastmaster awards and has completed 10 paths in Toastmasters pathways. He has been a president's distinguished division director, a distinguished area director in the past. Outside of Toastmasters, he has played several leadership roles in Fortune 500 companies, startups, and nonprofits. Currently, he is building his own edutech startup, Practive, which he founded in June 2020. He's going to attempt his level five project two speech of persuasive influence and the project title is to prepare to speak professionally. The purpose of this project is for the member to practice developing and presenting a longer speech. The timing for the speech is 18 to 22 minutes. Best of luck, Toastmaster Saurav. Changing your career track. Changing your career track, Toastmaster Saurav. Thank you, Toastmaster Sovik. So how many of you here are happy in your job or whatever you're doing, your business, your job? No one. A whole room full of people who are dissatisfied with their current professional life. How is that possible? Okay. I see someone raising her hand. Um, Gauri. Okay. She just took her hand down. No, no, no. I'm there. Okay. So, Gauri, are you happy with your profession, what you do currently? Yes, I am. And what do you do currently? I'm an image consultant and a soft skills trainer. And what is your academic you background? Oh, I am a chartered accountant. So, what happened that you moved from chartered accountancy to soft skills training? I mean, those are not really related, right? COVID happened. And uh, that's why that switch happened. Otherwise, it would have never happened. Okay. So suddenly after COVID, you felt like we don't need chartered accountants anymore. No, I started liking this course more. And um, I started getting opportunities um, even before I finished my course. It felt like less work and uh, mm -hmm. more play. Okay. So okay. that's why. Lovely. Thank you so much. And... Uh, I'm sorry for putting you in a spot that was not intentional, but uh, definitely that helped me anchor what I'm going to start talking about uh, right now. The reason I ask these questions to Gauri is because there's a first question we need to ask ourselves that when we want to make a career switch, that why do we want to make a career switch? And that why is very important because that why is what drives us. 
most probably we never asked ourselves that why when we made our first career choice. How did we make our first career choice? I mean, uh, how many of you? So let me uh, now uh, put someone else on spot. Smruti, what did you study in college? I'm an MBA. You're an MBA. And why did you decide to do an MBA? Was it your decision or your parents' decision? Uh, cumulatively. Exactly. So that's the, that's the other point, right? That many a times that when we make our career choices, even our academic choices, we don't decide on our own. Um, you know, it may be true for me, it may be true for um, it, may, it may be true for Smruti, it may be true for a lot of people here in this room. It may even be true for Swavik, though I don't think that he will admit to it since Samita is there in the room, that our parents sometimes put us under pressure to make career choices because that's what they think is the right career choice, right? And then we end up beca becoming engineers because our dad wanted us to be engineer or our mom wanted us to be engineer. And then we regret the entire life. And that is the point when we decide to make a change. So today's discussion is about that. So I'm going to share my screen because it's a 22 minutes long presentation. And I don't think I will be able to engage you for 22 minutes if I am not. Let me know if you can see my screen. Can you give me a thumbs up? Because I can't see anyone. Yes, I can see. Okay, lovely. So this is the road to change and that we are going to talk about now. But before I go there, I want to I want to answer a very basic question that how do I qualify to talk about that and why do I qualify to talk about that? So if you look at my career trajectory, I have had um, a primary track, career track and a secondary career track. And even within the primary career track, if you see, I have been in sales and business development, to marketing and communications, to strategy and consulting, to data science and analytics, to now entrepreneurship in the field of edutech, teaching and training. None of this is directly related. Maybe sales to marketing does look like a natural progression, but then suddenly from there to strategy and consulting and then out of nowhere, data science and analytics happens, right? And then if you see, there's always been a secondary career track in terms of teaching, training, public speaking, which I've been doing from 2010. And then I had a short stint in entrepreneurship in 2015 to 2016. And now again, um, you know, back to entrepreneurship from since 2019. So this slide probably will give you some confidence that I do qualify to talk about this because I've successfully made a lot of career shifts. I use the word successful um, with a lot of caution because um, I consider myself to be successful because the metrics of success that we define, whether it's your, in terms of the growth that you got, in terms of the, um, the perquisites, the salary, the increment, the responsibilities, the designation, positions, all of that in terms of professional success is something that I got. So is that the real definition of success? That's a topic for a speech on another day. But for now, we'll go with that particular thing that it was a reasonably successful move. So whenever you're changing your career, this is a mind map uh, that I created. And this is very complex, I know. So what I've done is I've broken it down into smaller parts. And I want you to focus on some of these four blocks that I'm going to talk about. The first is the reasons for change. This is where it all starts. Why do you want to make the change? The second is planning the transition. The third is the steps that you need to take. And the fourth is overcoming the challenges. Challenges will definitely be there. So even if you do everything right, still you will face a roadblock. And how do we handle that? So let us start with the reasons. As we heard Gauri mention that for her, she found a job satisfaction in something that is happening, that happened after COVID, due to COVID. And she found that this makes sense. Many a times, the reasons for career change comes because of the lack of job satisfaction in your current job. Whatever I'm doing, I'm not happy with it. Um, this is a very common problem in the IT sector because the job description and the actual job responsibilities, many a times they don't really match. Or the job designation and the job responsibilities, they don't match. Another reason that we want to go for a change is the work-life balance. Something changes on our personal side because of which we don't, we can't give enough time that we were giving earlier to the particular job that we were doing. So we want to go for something else. Uh, for instance, it could be that you started a family, you got married, um, you or, or you had a kid. And those kind of reasons force you to consider a career change because without that, 
um, you will not be able to manage both work and home. Financial incentives, because you're not getting paid enough. And in that sector, you probably will not see a lot of growth. And personal growth. Personal growth happens because uh, the personal growth is important because sometimes you're getting all the financial growth. You're seeing, you're having a good work-life balance. You're having a reasonable amount of job satisfaction, but you feel that you're not growing. Now, interestingly, when I look at my career journey, so the shift from sales and mass sales to business, to sales and business development to marketing happened for the reason that I was not getting job satisfaction in sales and business development. I was not happy doing what I'm doing. So I was not looking forward to my one Mondays. I was rather looking forward to my Fridays. And actually there were no Fridays into that role. There were no Saturdays as well. There were only Sundays. So I was actually looking forward to my Sundays and not to my Mondays. And then I decided this is not the right thing that I'm doing, right? So I decided to make a career move. I moved from marketing to strategy and consulting kind of roles because of a very simple reason that is financial incentives. There was a huge amount of uh, jump that I got from the company that offered me the job, which was Hewlett Packard. And I just couldn't say no. Along with that, they were giving me a, from a, a transfer to a city that I wanted to stay in, and that is Bangalore. And so this was the reasons why I decided to make that shift. Now, if you look at my shift from strategy and consulting to a a role of data science and analytics, it was more because of personal growth because there I was not seeing much personal growth happening because though I was getting salary and everything, I was not seeing myself growing in the truest sense. And I decided to go for something which was at that point of time, the data scientist job was called the sexiest job of the century, right? So it was the most reasonable career move for me when that opportunity came my way. So fortunately, unfortunately, I've never had to make a decision to make a career track change because of work-life balance or the lack of it. But these were the reasons. So I mentioned this specifically for you to understand that it may be that you will have multiple career changes and multiple career changes for different reasons. It is not always that you make a career change because you're not getting paid enough. In fact, this is something that I would always caution you that if you are just making a job change or you are just making a sector change because you are not getting paid enough, then you're probably setting yourself up for a failure because what will happen is by changing jobs and changing companies, you will make yourself an expensive resource. And in very uh, short period of time, you'll realize that the market cannot afford you. People want to hire you, but you're in such a pay bracket that if they're hiring you, you're probably getting paid more than your manager or your manager's manager. And that is not something that will be feasible. This is a very, very practical problem. So never ever make career changes for a single reason multiple times or multiple career changes for a single reason in a very short span of time. The second thing is planning. This entire thing about career change has a lot of element of planning into it. There's a wish list, there's a dream, and there's what something that we can accomplish. So the first thing that we need to do is self-assessment. That what am I capable of doing? I want to be a trainer. That's a wish list. Just like, you know, I want to be a cricketer. But is it possible for me to uh, be a cricketer? No, because I can't even, uh, you know, do a proper uh, fielding. Uh, I can't even take a catch on the field. So forget about getting uh, a chance in the India cricket team. I probably not even get a chance in the Gully cricket team. That reality has to sink in with you. And you need to do that with a lot of uh, head rather than a lot of heart. I feel I can do this is generally one of the worst assessments that we do. And we make the plunge and then we are like, oh my God, this is not for me. I was better doing that job. If you are making a career change and you're shifting back to your old job, it does two things. One, it puts a dent in your career trajectory, which is noticeable. And the second thing is, it actually makes a dent in your confidence. That you feel that I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough in this job. I'm not good enough in that other job that I tried. So basically, I'm not good enough. And that is not a very great feeling to have. The next is research. There's a lot of research that needs to go into your career change. Don't just make a move because you feel that everyone else is doing great in that particular field. A lot of people during my 10 years in data science and analytics uh, and then strategy business, that, that particular tenure from 2009, 2009 to 2019, I have met a lot of people who I took interviews and they were doing reasonably well in the job that they were doing. Some were working in a BPO, some were in a sales job, some were in a marketing job. 
And the suddenly everyone wanted to come to data science. And I asked them that, why do you want to come to data science? And the reason was that there's a lot of money. There's a lot of growth opportunity. You know, I can go to US. These responses just gave me the feeling that you are not doing enough research. And, you know, many of them would not even be able to answer the next level of question. Like, for example, why do you want to go to US? And they're stuck. No, US is a great country. How do you know? No, I am, you know, people who are there, my friends told me. I have friends who told me who are in US and they're dying every second day to come back to India. In fact, most of my NRI friends, when I reach there, they call me over because I can talk about India. Right. So that is the kind of homesickness that they face. So you need to do your own research to understand how green is the grass actually on the other side. Then comes networking. See, when you are moving from one side of the one island to a different island, you need a bridge. You just can't fly over. And that bridge has to be people on both sides. You cannot be networking based on only the people on this side, neither on that side. Somewhere there has to be a handshake happening somewhere. And that connectivity is very important, which means that you need to use your, cur your current position or your current job to make the bridge for the next job. For instance, if I take Gaudi's example, so she is a chartered accountant and she wants to move into training. So the best way for Gaudi to probably do is do soft skills training for chartered accountants rather than doing trying to do training for, say, doctors. Now, let me take the example of Bindu. So Bindu is a cancer specialist. She's a doctor. Now, Bindu, if she wants to be a soft skills trainer, not that she wants to be any day, I, I don't think so. She's very happy being a doctor. But if she does want to be, then I think one of the best ways of doing it is to start doing soft skills training for doctors. Because that's how the bridge and the networking happens. And finally, skill development. Because the new job will need new skill sets. And you need to be very modest and very humble. So when I joined, when I moved into uh, training and coaching and this industry, I was trained by people who were almost half my age. I was trained by people who just passed out of college. And initially, it was a huge uh, you know, uh, shock for me that I, am, I, am I that worthless that people that I was interviewing yesterday for positions in my company are now going to teach me how to walk, how to talk, how to dress, how to smile, how not to smile and so on. Even how to shake hands for that matter. You know, I got after I came into image consulting, I got to know there are so many types of handshakes. Oh my God. So these skill developments are very important when you're trying to make that career shift. Just because you had some proven success in your previous job, it doesn't mean that you can wear that glory into your next job as well. So new skills needs new investments. And that is the most important part of this entire planning phase. Then comes the steps that you need to take. Now, one of the most important things that you need to understand that you need to have a very clear goal. My first company, which I started post COVID, that company did not succeed for many reasons. I tell everyone that it's COVID, uh, but that's the safest answer to give, right? I mean, uh, ever since COVID happened for anything that went wrong in our life, uh, we started blaming COVID. During COVID, we were even blaming COVID for constipation. So that is the kind of thing that we are doing with COVID. But the real reason for that, if I look back, it is not only COVID, it is also because I did not have a proper goal. I just started that because I thought that that's something that I wanted to do. Now, when I started my second company, I had a very proper goal. I knew very clearly what I want to do with this and I where I want to do, go with that. So if you set the proper goal, then the next question comes is, do you want to do a job or do you want to go for a business? Because many a times our career change does not only moving from one sector to another sector, it also means moving from one form of employment to another form of employment, moving from being a salaried professional to a, uh, say, a, um, uh, you know, freelancer or moving from being a freelancer to an entrepreneur or being from moving from being an entrepreneur to an investor or from an investor to a philanthropist. So that specific move also is very important. So let me take just two examples here. If you're applying for a job, in that case, updating the resume, preparing for the interviews. If you're going for a business, then in that case, thinking about the elements of business like funding, business plan, the market research that goes in setting up the business. All of this together is important in setting up the career track and in taking the next steps. Finally comes the challenges that we face. Uh, one very important thing 
the first one I would say is family and social support. This is very important because suddenly you will see a big change in everything around you. Your income will plunge. You will lose your sleep. You will spend more time and earn less money. And your family members, even if they have the best intent to support, they will be like, oh my God, what just happened? They will question. It's very rare that you will find that your parents or your partners will not question you. That why did you at all need to make that change? If it is for your personal growth, the questions will be even more intense. We were learning so well. What bit you, man? Why did you go and leave your job? How do you explain to them that if, they, if I would have continued in this job, I would have probably died of depression very soon. You can't explain to them. So these are very emotional things which drives you. So it's very important for you to express yourself to your family and take your family and your social circle along with you. Not only family, your friends, your relatives, your neighbors for that matter. You know, they would just not understand a small taunt here or a small rebuke there will break your confidence, shattered. It, it, it gets shattered. So that is one thing that you need to, that you will face, the lack of family and social support. Skill gaps. Sometimes when we are looking into that market from outside, we feel, oh, this needs this. You know, most people who come into soft skills training, they feel that, you know, I can speak good English, so I can be a soft skills trainer. What's the problem? What do they do actually? They just read from the slide, no? Big deal. Yes. That is also one way of training, but that's not a sustainable way of having a growth in a, a career in training. Very soon, people will not want to have you as a trainer if that's all that you are doing, coming and speaking impeccable English, looking at a set of slides. So the skill gaps that are there are very real. And sometimes we don't identify them till we take the plunge. Financial concerns, as I mentioned, with every such career track change, there will be a serious financial concern that you will face. You suddenly you'll find it difficult to pay your bills, to keep up with your investment goals, to buy the assets that you wanted to buy. Even basic stuff, sometimes it becomes a hand-to-mouth situation and you need to be prepared for that. Financially, emotionally, socially, in every aspect. And the last one, the fear of the unknown. What will happen? No one has that answer. And on top of that, there are certain laws like the Murphy's law, that if something has to go wrong, will go wrong. With the best intent, you'll do something and it will not work out. I still remember I had uh, my first training I did for a, a co-working company called WeWorks. I planned everything. You know, I still have that bundle of pens that I bought. I bought some hundred pens. Uh, the people who hired me for that training, they said 50 is the minimum attendance that you will get. So be prepared for at least 50. And I was overtly enthusiastic. So I prepared for 100. I had 100 worksheets, 100 manuals, 100 pens, 100 boards to write with. And I just had two attendees. My first session, there were two people who attended. One was the person who invited me and the other person who had coffee sitting there. Till the time the coffee was not over, he was there. The moment the coffee was over, he left. So for three-fourths of the session, I had only one person apart from me in that entire session. Utterly demotivating. And I felt that, you know, I am finished because I left everything and took this up. And this was like going nowhere. So the fear of the unknown will be there and it will bug you time and again. But that's something that's a part of the change. So that's it from my side. These are the things that we need to keep in mind. I'll quickly go back to the Biden map once again. Remember, whenever you're going for a career track change, these are the things that you need to keep in mind. The reasons for the change, the planning that you need to do along with it, the steps that you need to take, and the challenges that you need to be cognizant about. It is not a very easy decision. And you should take this decision only after putting a lot of thoughts into it. At the same time, people who have made this decision hardly regret. They either succeed immediately or they succeed eventually. But succeed, they do. Thank you. I can take questions if there are any because I still see the yellow card. If anyone has any question, I'm open for it. Any questions? Okay. Uh, uh, Sir, this is Mukund. I do have a question. Can I yes, ask? Please. Yes, please. <clears throat> uh, okay. So. 
So this is something practical which I have observed happening with other people, right? You are not happy with your job. And then you take time to plan. You plan, plan, plan for two years. And then you research, research, research for two years. You build your network. Everything is fine. Now, two years down the road, right? You are finally at the point where you have decided to take the plunge. So when I say take the plunge, I mean you are quitting your old job and you're moving into your new profession or a new job or a new vocation or whatever it might be. Now, two months into the new vocation or into the new job, you suddenly start feeling or suddenly start getting, you know, thoughts about whether what you did now is really right or not, right? You have taken so much time in planning, researching, and now you are fully convinced. But just two months, you are actually seeing the practical aspects of your new vocation, your new job, which you had never thought of while you were planning and researching and networking. Right? That's, yeah, so that's what, the fear of the unknown, right? That's, that's what you're talking about is basically the fear of the unknown. But that's going to be disastrous is what I'm trying to say. If It is, yeah. It is going to be disastrous at times. And that's why I said, you know, initially it, it will be a shock and it is something... You know, that curve will always be there where you will go downhill and then you'll lease the abyss and then you'll come up and that will always be there. And we don't know how deep is that abyss. We don't know how long is the curve of the downfall. So that challenge will always be there. So one thing I can see, Mukund, like, see, there is, if it was so easy and there was a magic formula and I knew that I would not be sitting here in a Toastmaster meeting and sharing this for free, right? I would be selling this and monetizing this and probably sitting on my chartered flight on my way to Bahamas as we speak. <laughs> But so one thing, but I know one thing very clearly. See, when the light in your room is not working, you change the light first. If still it does not work, then you change the electrical connection. If it's a regular problem with the lighting, with the electricity, then you think of changing your house. If my drawing room light is not working, I go and buy a new house because I want to make a change. If that sounds like naive, that is what would happen if we don't think of all the possibilities before making a career change. I first started entrepreneurship in 2015 and I took a good four or five years to ultimately take the plunge because that short stint actually gave me a dipstick idea of what to expect, what not to expect. So probably one thing could be that instead of give, committing 100% to it, try doing it as a secondary career track, like what I was doing, right? I've been doing training and teaching for a very long time before I actually decided to go into it full time. So that could be one way of safeguarding and your things. Yeah, but again, there's no uh, advice. Uh, no, you have really hit the nail on the head. Uh, my two cents, I know we are overrunning the time. My two cents here is that there is a book called The Working Identity. And it's mm -hmm. written by a professor of uh, London Business School. Her name is Herminia Ibarra, and she actually tackles this problem on, you know, what happens once you get into the new vocation and start feeling that it is not the right thing for you. So uh, I would suggest maybe I'll speak about this in the club one of these days, but right now I will just stop and say, maybe if you get a chance, please, you know, sure. everyone. For the benefit of everyone, you can actually put this on the chat. And I have a couple of questions from Bindu directly. I will answer Bindu directly because we are way over time. And uh, the team mod is like, I need to go and have dinner. Okay. So back to you, Saurav. Thank you, Toastmaster Saurav. It's not just me. Everybody's tummies must be rolling now. So without wasting any time, we move on to the next section. That is the evaluation section. Speeches without evaluators are arrows without direction. These feedbacks are meant not only for the speakers themselves, but also for our potential speakers who might commit the same mistake other day. We now next move on to the next section. I would like to call evaluator number one, Toastmaster Mamta Singh. Is she there? Yes, I'm here. She's currently pursuing her executive education at the Indian School of Business, Hyderabad, and hails from the steel city of India, Bukaru. Her hobbies are drinking, driving, reading books, and cooking. Toastmaster Mamta will be evaluating Toastmaster Yogita. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, TA Modi of the day, to, uh, Toastmaster Sovik. Uh, my target speaker, Toastmaster Yogita. First of all, congratulations for completing your uh, speech. That to 22-40 minutes. I understand that 
uh, this this is very difficult uh, driving a talk of 20, 20 to 40 minutes, but you did an amazing job and you came out with the flying colors. Congratulations for that. Now, coming to your evaluation, uh, your, the topic uh, which you chose was uh, like how to write the impactful speech. And you, the platform which you used is the Toastmaster. Here, everyone are speakers and everyone uh, you know, think about how to improve our communication skill, speech, or maybe how to be the best speaker in the club and all. And whatever the content was there in the in your discussion that was completely resonating with the audience, what you have, that is the Toastmasters. So I can say you hit the right nail over here and I can connect with that. Now coming to the objective of your speech, it was to facilitate a panel discussion, which you did, uh, uh, kudos to you. Uh, coming to the impact, uh, you you uh, had the right set of questions. Now, being the driver of a panel discussion, it's become very crucial for for you to uh, to write the right set of questions. No, no matter how knowledgeable your panelists are, it it completely depends upon you. If you do not uh, uh, like ask the right set of question, you are not going to leverage the opportunity. Uh, which is in front of you and uh, the audience has to pay because at the end of the day, audience is also sitting over here to learn. Uh, but um, in your uh, uh, discussion, uh, all the questions like how to, uh, how, uh, what are the key elements to improve our speeches, pitfalls to avoid, messages should, how to understand that messages are uh, resonating with your audience. All those things, even I as an evaluator, I was listening and I learned a lot from, from your discussion. Now, uh, coming to the point of recommendation here, I have two points. First, I saw you uh, looking down and using the supporting documents. I understand that you had prepared some questions and you had your own answers. I understand that. And you wanted to add your own flavors uh, to the, all those questions, uh, which is good. But uh, what was not okay, I, I saw you looking at uh, the answers, like you you, you had the questions, you had prepared your answer, but by you are looking into the uh, cheat sheet, I can say. It, it's more like a podcast you were doing. So if you would have not used all those things, that would have taken your speech to another uh, level. And the second was the time management. Uh, the, the entire crux of your discussion was about the audience how to understand your audience, how to impress your audience, how to resonate your message with the audience. But at the end of your discussion, your audience didn't get the time to ask the question to your panelist. Uh, so if, and, and you, uh, I saw you re reading the questions because, because of the time constraint. But if, if you would have allowed your audience to ask the question in, in their own voice to the panelist, that would have uh, made the environment more inclusive. So that was the point of recommendation. And overall, if I summarize, connect-wise, uh, objective-wise, impact-wise, all good. Just to uh, recommendation, time management, and do not use any kind of cheat sheet in your speech. Thank you, and all the best. Thank you. Thank you, evaluator. Next, calling upon Toastmaster Shilpa Reddy. She's an image consultant, corporate coach, an ex-corporate and an entrepreneur by heart, a risk taker career-wise, a night out and a compassionate capitalist at work, a travel buff and a music lover who enjoys riding bikes as well as cooking. She is also extremely accommodating, adjusting her schedule to be here today too. Toastmaster Shilpa will be evaluating Toastmaster Fatima. Over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Temori Sawit. Um, good evening, everyone, and a big hi to Toastmaster Fatima, please bear with my voice a little bit. Uh, Toastmaster Fatima, I understand your pathway is presentation mastery. And uh, this is your pathbreaker speech. So my evaluation is going to be very, in very simple language for you to understand and very crisp. As I have only three minutes to evaluate a 20 minute speech. And I'd like to take the liberty uh, to ignore the evaluation resource and the purpose of the speech for today. So Toastmaster Fatima, it is not easy to start a pathway and to finish all the levels while being a part of executive committee. It is so much of work. And so is the experience that you gain from being a part and the achievement. So my hearty congratulations for you for coming this far. Kudos to you. So you started with a, a lovely question. What is Toastmasters? 
to the Toastmasters. For a minute, um, I thought since you are a VPPR, I thought you're marketing Toastmasters. However, your presentation slides show your capability uh, in the creative area. Well done on that front. All right. So when you started your presentation, I wondered for a moment too early that why is she talking about these details? Everyone here knew about these details, but I felt, let me wait and see. You slowly slided into your Toastmaster journey from the Toastmaster details, which you started speaking about after almost 10 minutes. So the first 10 minutes you spoke about what is Toastmasters? When did it start? How did you, how did, how was it? When was it set up, et cetera, et cetera. So you gave only 10 minutes for us to know about your actual journey. That I felt was a bit short. Well, speaking about your journey, um, Toastmaster Fatima, you've come up a long way, I have to agree. You have taken the courage to join Toastmasters, referred by your cousin, to take up various roles, to be an active member of the executive committee in all the clubs that you are a part of. You are part of different clubs, I understand. You have taken part in contests without any hesitation. The best part also is that you have learned not only public speaking, but time management, working with the team, canvas. You've improved your creative skills, public relations skills. I admire the attitude that you have here and your capacity to soak like a sponge, your appetite to upskill yourself. To, to sum up, you have been excellent as a Toastmasters in terms of learning. Your vocal variety was magical. You should have taken less time to explain what Toastmasters is and speak more about your journey. And I also observed that your energy has come down a little bit. So you should have smiled here and there, especially when you're talking about achievements, right? And your conclusion was, was a kickstart to our journey. Your quotes left us a message so strong that we will remember you and your journey all through. So congratulations for completing your path and all the very best for your upcoming one. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Toastmaster. Thank you, Evaluator. Calling on Evaluator number three, Toastmaster Smruti. She was a sales manager by profession and a certified soft skills trainer by interest. After almost a decade, she is now a full-time management student by the virtue of time. She joined Toastmaster to sharpen her saw of public speaking Outside of Toastmaster, she is a mindful, introverted soul whose life revolves around food made by others and family and dance. Toastmaster Smriti will be evaluating Toastmaster Saurav. We are never too old to set another goal or to dream a new dream. Career path or career change is married to the concept of the fear of unknown. I was revisiting everything which were coming in my mind by listening to your speech today, a prolonged speech of 18 to 22 minutes. You gave me insights of not only the content, but established it well by the beautiful delivery of the speech. Couple of things which highlighted and elevated the speech, first being the initial engagement and, and the fine touch of humor, even while interacting with the audience. That hold my attention and I completely believe that same the reciprocation will be from the other audience. Second is the credibility which you established while you were making a point that why me? Why I am here to deliver the speech today. The transition of from you to other was very beautiful. You established a credibility which made more sense to listen to you more with your experience coming into picture. Third is example in each and every step. You highlighted four steps not only the steps, the definition, but real life example in each and every segment helped me to understand the content a bit more. With that content, you met the objective of the project being developing and presenting a longer speech duration today. Now, second is let's talk about the speech project objective, which was uh, to have certain engagement, which we did the keynote style speaking, presentation and delivering a compelling content. While we are narrating and holding a lot gravity on content, I would like to touch upon the delivery part slightly a bit. Not a point of recommendation, however, can we be a bit mindful with these fellow points. 
first being the non verbal cue today while delivering the entire speech i saw the movement of hands being a soft skills trainer i might be seeing it more the hand was more towards touching the face we know that when we touch our face more frequently in any part it means some kind of either distraction to the audience or some kind of disengagement for the speaker while delivering we can be a slight mindful about the same second 90 Six to ninety-seven percentage of time, the usage of right hand was very visible. I'm assuming it was right, and the other hand was not at all visible in the camera. Can we do something when we speak next time, especially to a longer duration speech? We can use both our hands to capture the entire virtual screen. That will hold a lot of more gravity to it. And third is the mid engagement part. I was just curious to know. Okay, you had Q and A in the last part. You had interaction in the first part. How about the mid part? Can we bring certain question? Ask people. Are we there with us in their entire speech duration? Because we know it's a longer speech. Overall, it's a great speech where we touched upon the great content. Delivery was taken care. Having said that, if we can fine tune a bit with mindful non-verbal gestures and also mid engagement, it will definitely take to the next level. I love the speech, love the content. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to evaluate. Back to the Toastmaster of the day. Thank you, evaluator. We now move to the timer's report. So I call Postmaster, uh, the timer of the day, to please take over. Uh, yeah. So for the table topics, all the members were within the time limit. So uh, everyone is qualified. Uh, for prepared speeches, uh, two of the Toastmasters overshot the time limit. Uh, only one uh, speech was within the time limit. Uh, for evaluation, everyone was within the time limit. Yeah, that's all from my side. Thank you, Daima. While I ask the Zoom master to launch the poll, and we eagerly, okay, we have the polls ready. Uh, we first have the poll for our favorite evaluator. I request everyone to poll in their answers. While the Zoom master prepares the other two polls, I would like to remind everyone of how the session went. We went about talking about life from, during our table topic session. We went about thinking on how to win speech contests with our speakers. We learned how other people's Toastmaster journey is and ultimately learning how to change your career. So from life to career, we are discussing everything in this club. Over to our next poll, that is for the favorite table topic speaker. I hope everybody remembers which speakers spoke on life. There were emotional topics. There were some really difficult topics given by a table topics master. Now we move, uh, I'll give the stage to tape, uh, Toastmaster Saurav as he takes the, as he moves, as we move forward in the meeting. Thank you so much, uh, Postmaster uh, Sovik. And because we don't have a general evaluator today, I would, uh, before I conclude the meeting, I would want to appreciate a few people. I will not give any critical feedback, but some appreciation is in order. First is I want to appreciate uh, two people who are doing two difficult projects for the very first time. First is Postmaster Atiya from Singapore, uh, from Sri Lanka. She uh, did her, uh, she did her, keynote speech, I think, for the very first time, Atiya. And uh, congratulations, uh, because you held on the audience's attention for the full duration and a wonderful uh, time management. Uh, as you can see, the other two of us got disqualified. So great job with that, Atiya. Um, and uh, the second person is Toastmaster Yogita. Yogita conducted a panel discussion for the first time. And uh, Yogita, wonderfully done. It is a bit daunting, I know, conducting a panel discussion, particularly when you have got all most of the people who are district champions in that panel. So definitely uh, you were able to hold your foot, ask all the right questions, have the control, the command, and you maintained a calm and a poise uh, all throughout the session. So absolutely loved it. I must appreciate Toastmaster Sovik 
who's taking up the Toastmaster of the Day role for the first time at the Gabby's, if I'm not wrong, Sauve. Is that correct? Yeah, at the Gabby's, it's the first time. Yes, at the Gabby's, it's the first time. Uh, and uh, and uh, this is not a meeting where it's very easy to be a team mod because generally a team mod has a script and then you go with that, you can engage the audience. Here I'm more like you're connecting the dots. Not a very exciting role to play, uh, but he, she, he was there throughout and he managed to uh, stay awake and keep us awake. Thank you so much, Sovik, for doing their bit. Tanu, for being the timer for the first time, right, Tanu? Right, and again, this is not a regular Toastmaster meeting where she had two different kind of timings, not the standard five to seven minutes timing. Some was 18 to 22, some was 20 yeah. to 40. Then the panel, disc, then the uh, table topics were one to two minutes, the evaluation two to three minutes. Wonderful job, Tanu, in this entire oh, meeting. Thank you. And um, our table topic master, uh, Smruti, who picked it up at the end of the hour, uh, not at the 11th hour, but probably at the 13th hour when the meeting actually got started, she got to know that she's the table topic master. And still I hear she had wonderful topics and even tough topics to dole out. And uh, no meeting of the Gabby's uh, can be completed without appreciating one person who I'm now going to spotlight. And uh, that is Toastmaster Dina McEnroy. Toastmaster Dina McEnroy, I always appreciate for her love for speaking and um, the way she comes every time with full enthusiasm and contributes to the meeting. Thank you so much, Dina. Uh, Dina, I cannot uh, adjourn the meeting without a, a small shout out from your side. Mm -hmm. Did you like the meeting, Dina? Mm -hmm. no! Thank you. Thank you, Dina. I love to, I love to listen to uh, whenever you say uh, that you loved it, you liked it, and you love us. And I always say we love you, Dina. And thank you for meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Please take care. And with this, I would now announce, uh, announce the results for the polls today. It has already been done, concluded. So there is no favorite speaker poll, uh, though we do have a favorite speaker, and that is Toastmaster Ati Ardeen, because our other two evaluator speakers are disqualified. That includes me as well. So congratulations, Toastmaster Atiya, for being the favorite speaker today. I'm pretty sure if the polls would have been conducted, you still would have been the favorite speaker because I absolutely loved your keynote. Uh, all of us who are new in Toastmasters, we benefited a lot from your presentation today. Coming to the favorite evaluator, the favorite evaluator is the person who told me to use more of my left hand. I'm trying to do that already. And <laughs> that is Toastmaster Smriti Mohanty. So Smriti, uh, thank you so much for your feedback. <laughs> I'll keep this in mind. <laughs> okay. And uh, coming to the best table topic speaker, so well. When you have a district champion in the room, what else do you expect? The, the, and where is she? she? Did she leave? Yeah, she left. So the favorite table topic speaker for today is the um, last year's table topic champion of District 98, Toastmaster Joan Joseph. Congratulations, Joan, for joining our meeting and giving a wonderful topic. Thank you so much. And with this, I adjourn this meeting of the Gabby's International Toastmasters Club. And oh yeah, a joint winner for the table topics is Toastmaster Dina. I forgot to mention there are two winners. One is Toastmaster Dina for a wonderful speech on chat and Toastmaster Juan Joseph for the wonderful speech on camera. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a lovely rest of the evening, rest of the day. Thank you.